So just to further introduce myself, uh, my current position, I'm the director of the Ag Analytical Services Lab at Penn State. I've been there for about a year and a few months. Uh, I did my postdoc after finishing my, my uh, PhD at Virginia Tech at uh, the ARS in, in Beltsville, Maryland. That's where I did most of the work that, that I'm going to refer to today to illustrate some of these principles. When I finished my postdoc at ARS, I took a position uh, with University of Massachusetts in a very similar position to what I'm in now as, as director of their soil test lab and, and soil fertility specialist. And while I was there, I, I had the opportunity to work with uh, a number of uh, small market uh, organic vegetable producers and gained some, some good experiences there, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those. So just to sort of set the tone, I just want to start by uh, posing this question. You know, is soil fertility management and organic cropping systems fundamentally different? Uh, and, and just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, and, and you know, get an idea of, of it, at least where, you know, my opinion. Uh, I, I really see that see is the, the processes are the same. It's the rules that are different. So here I'm talking about, you know, the legally defined USDA certified organic. So whether or not we're managing things organically or, or otherwise, you know, the same chemical, physical, biological processes in soil, uh, they're, they're the same. What's different uh, is the rules. So in organic cropping systems, you know, we've got to be much more creative in, in how we meet our crops' nutrient needs. They have the same requirements. We've just got to use uh, different materials due to limitations uh, imposed on them. So, you know, this framework uh, for nutrient stewardship still works. You know, we've still got to think about, you know, what's the right rate or the right source with the right time and the right placement. Uh, and, and, you know, we may use a, a different set of, of uh, or, or may reprioritize uh, this, this suite of, of cropping system objectives, but we've still, you know, we've got to make a profit. Uh, we've got to hit our yield goals and, and, you know, we've got to have some level of uh, environmental stewardship and long-term sustainability. So I'm going to try and touch on each of these aspects, uh, more or less a, a, a very broad overview. Uh, we'll, we'll drill down and, and go into detail on a few things. But as I move through this, if, if you've got any questions uh, or, or just, uh, want to contribute to the conversation, please don't hesitate to interrupt. I've, I've left plenty of time at the end for, for questions and dialogue then, too. So one more thing. You know, the, the title of my talk is a little bit misleading. Uh, as we, you know, when we think about soil fertility and nutrient management, when we think about all the essential plant nutrients, I'm really going to focus on nitrogen. Uh, and, and both my research and extension experience, you know, uh, I really see uh, nitrogen as, as really being the most, uh, both the most limiting nutrient in these cropping systems and, and the most challenging to manage. So I'm really going to focus on that. We'll talk about some of the others, but that's where I'm really going to focus. So when we think about uh, nutrient sources in organic cropping systems, um, you know, these are the, the, the big three categories that, that I usually think about. Manure byproducts uh, and composts, legumes, and soil organic matter. And I think most of us, when we think about nutrient management in these systems, you know, tend to you know, gravitate toward these guys, you know, the, the inputs, the organic inputs, <clears throat> and certainly play a, a, an important role, but uh, as I hope to illustrate, you know, it, it, it can't be the sole source, and, and that's due to a number of reasons we'll talk about. Uh, of course, legumes, I, I, I'm going to try and make the case, and I, I think uh, successfully, that it, it's certainly the most sustainable source of nitrogen in these systems. And finally, we need to recognize the, uh, the importance of soil organic matter in these systems. All of the practices that we employ here uh, tend to enrich soil organic matter and ends up being a, a really important source of, of nutrients in these systems, especially nitrogen. So spend a little bit more time talking about uh, organic byproducts. <clears throat> One of the, the beneficial aspects of these uh, materials uh, is that they're, they're complex whole nutrient sources. So we get nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, plus the, you know, the, the full complement of all the secondary macronutrients, uh, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, uh, as well as all the micronutrients. So it's a whole nutrient source. Uh, you know, we, we do have to consider that not all of these, because they are organic, are, are immediately available. This is especially true of phosphorus. Uh, you know, most of the, the nitrogen in these materials is organic, so it's got to be mineralized, converted into inorganic forms that are plant available but <clears throat> before the plant can take them up. For phosphorus, uh, we've got both organic and inorganic forms. For the most part, I tend to think of the, the phosphorus as being more or less uh, commercial fertilizer or soluble fertilizer equivalent. Uh, when we go back and look at the, some of the early research that was done on these materials, what they found is that anywhere from, you know, 75 to 90 percent 
of that would be available. Uh, and I would say it's important to account. Uh, however, what we'll look at here in a minute is typically when you apply these materials at a rate high enough to meet nitrogen needs, you're applying way more phosphorus than what you need. So it really doesn't matter that you're only getting three quarters of that phosphorus if you've applied ten times uh, you know, what you actually need. Uh, and for potassium, we're essentially looking at you know, ionic, mostly soluble, mostly soluble forms. <clears throat> Some of the, the challenges with these materials, of course, you know, they, they are typically byproducts and, you know, as you might expect, uh, they have variable nutrient content, certainly something we need to consider. Uh, Cost-wise, we start getting into uh, problems where we're looking at, at a lot of these blended byproducts. You can buy these granulated uh, pelletized materials, really easy to handle with, with uh, you know, certainly less variable than, than a whole product like, you know, poultry litter or compost, but you're going to pay a lot more. Uh, and then finally, the, the last two, and these are the ones I'm really going to focus on, is you know, mineralization of those materials. Uh, we need to account for it, but recognize that it's difficult to predict. And finally, the, the fact that the, the nutrient ratios of these materials tend not to match crop needs. And this is especially true for, for nitrogen and phosphorus. Let's first talk a little bit more about mineralization. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a microbial process. You know, converting this organic nitrogen to plant available mineral forms. Uh, is influenced by a number of factors, not just the characteristics of the material itself, like carbon to nitrogen ratio, even the, the lignin content or the cellulose content, but also environmental conditions, temperature and moisture. So, you know, we can characterize these, and, you know, we've, we've set up pretty good book values so that, you know, we know for most materials what that mineralization is, but, you know, we can't predict the weather. Uh, so we've got to keep that in mind, that, that it's, it's going to be significantly influenced by the weather. Still, we need, to, we need to come up with some means of estimating how much uh, nitrogen we expect to get from these materials, and we can use these mineralization coefficients that we've defined. Um, and and you've got to recognize that it's, it's not one size fits all. You, know, you can't just use a, a simple rule of thumb for all organic materials. It varies. Everywhere from you know, 10 to 90 percent of that organic nitrogen uh, could mineralize over the growing season. We'll, we'll look at some uh, book values in a minute. First, I can show you how we establish those, we can either do it in the field or in the lab. You know, in the field, we'll take these materials at a, at a known rate and apply them to a known area, uh, and then just measure nitrogen uptake by a crop uh, over the growing season. Um, and then we can back calculate what portion of that total nitrogen that we applied was actually plant available. Uh, we can actually also do this in the lab, uh, where we can control those environmental conditions so we can get much more refined numbers uh, by sort of holding things at, at, at an optimum level. So we get a, a more consistent number that's really just tying into the, the characteristics of the material itself. Yes, sir? <clears throat> yes. So uh, the, the question was, do we back out the organic in? With these, all I'm talking about is the organic fraction. Uh, if we do have some inorganic material, we'll, we'll assume that that's all immediately plant available depending on how we handle it. And I'll come around to that in a minute. So for the organic materials, uh, we'll take these and, and combine them with field soils, all at an equivalent end rate, so we know, you know the amount of organic nitrogen that we've applied to each of these soils, uh, and then incubate them under optimum moisture and temperature uh, over what we call a long-term incubation, typically uh, at least 180 days. Sometimes we'll take it all the way out to 270 days. We're sure we've mineralized everything that's going to mineralize. And then periodically come in and extract uh, plant-available ammonium and nitrate. This is an example of a, a data set from my work as a postdoc at ARS in, in Beltsville. We looked at mineralization of four different materials, uh, straight feather meal. This is a, a blend of feather meal uh, and poultry litter, pelletized poultry litter and just ground poultry litter. So we've got a range of total nitrogen content here of 13 percent all the way down to 3 to 3.5 3 percent for the, for the straight poultry litters. We look at the, the mineralization curves. This is just for the unamended soil, so we're getting some mineralization just from the soil, and then for the amended soils with each of those materials. What we can do is, is back out, or subtract the amount of nitrogen that mineralized from the soil, so we can determine how much nitrogen came from the amendment itself, and we can come up with these mineralization coefficients. So with these, you know, basically what that says is 70% is of that total nitrogen mineralized over that 180-day period. So that, that's the fact that we would use to estimate how much nitrogen we're going to get from this material over a growing season. And all the way down the same for the rest of these. Now the other thing about having this uh, release over time 
is this is an exponential curve. So we can go in and actually determine the, the rate of release. How quickly does that nitrogen uh, mineralize? And we can actually calculate what is uh, a half-life. So a half-life meaning that you know, it, over this many days, half the nitrogen that's in there, uh, that organic nitrogen is going to be released. So we see that you know, with these materials, we've got a, a range in half-life anywhere from one to two weeks. So in one to two weeks, we've mineralized half that nitrogen. So in two weeks, three quarters of that nitrogen. In three weeks, it would be seven eighths of that nitrogen. So the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that up at this point is because it's something to think about with these materials you know, in, in terms of how that nitrogen release corresponds with crop end demand and how well those are synchronized. One of the things that I had always, I don't know when I was first introduced to feather meal, uh, probably as a postdoc at ARS, uh, you know, with something with 13% nitrogen, you know, it's pretty hot. I expected it to mineralize pretty quickly. I didn't realize a lot of the, the growers I worked with in New England relied on feather meal as this slow release, season long source of nitrogen. And when I shared this with them, it was just blown away that, you know, I mean, this is, you know, it, it's not urea, but, you know, it's certainly not compost. It's something that's going to mineralize pretty quick. So, you know, these are available. Uh, a lot of folks have, have done those studies going back into the, uh, you know, the 30s and 40s. And we've got a, a number of resources, some of them I'll, I'll share with you at the end, where we can look all these up. Um, and, you know, it's important, again, to go through that math and, and pencil it out and come up with an estimate of the amount of nitrogen that you expect to be released from those materials over a given growing season. And, you know, an example of, of the uh, calculation, we'll assume that, you know, some portion of that organic nitrogen uh, will become available based on, you know, the coefficient we pull out of the, the literature, and we assume that all of that ammonium's immediately available. But, you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, here we're, we're only, these are based on gross averages of the, you know, assuming the, those consistent uh, material characteristics. It's not considering the environmental factors. So you got to recognize that it's only an estimate. Um, and one of the things I, I pushed, uh, especially the growers I work with in New England and these uh, organic vegetable cropping systems is, is to use some means during the season to, to validate or you know, determine that you're actually getting as much nitrogen as you think you are in these systems and using some sort of in-season observation. And you know, the PSNT, I think, is an excellent tool for that. And then because I said I was going to hit on all four of those rights, we, I had to have a slide in here for, for placement. Uh, I think most of you guys recognize that you know, where we're surface applying organic residuals or anything that has uh, urea or ammonium in it, we've got to get that incorporated as quickly as possible to conserve that nitrogen. Otherwise, we, we lose a good portion of that as uh, ammonia to volatilization. So the other aspect, you know, thinking about uh, the nutrient content of these materials and how those ratios compare to uh, crop nutrient demand. Um, when we just look at this generalized relationship and we apply, you know, organic residual at a, at a rate high enough to meet nitrogen needs, it's pretty common for us to way over apply phosphorus. Um, so, you know, the, the, the good stewardship thing to do is, is, well, we apply it, you know, to meet the, the most limiting. So we apply it on a phosphorus basis. Of course, the, the problem there is that, you know, we, we run into uh, a, a pretty big gap there in nitrogen need that we've got to fill somehow. Just to illustrate that further, I've, I've uh, summarized this for, for five materials, a composted yard waste, composted manure, a uh, poultry litter, a blended feather meal poultry litter, and a straight feather meal, and worked out the, the calculations or an application rate that would give us uh, 120 pounds of plant available end per acre, and assumed we had a crop that was removing uh, 50 pounds of P2O5 per acre. So this is the, the application rates. And we're, when we're working with compost, applying those th materials at rates high enough to meet nitrogen needs, I mean, it's, it takes a lot of material. You know, we're talking about 40 to 80 tons, depending on whether it's an, a manure compost or a vegetable compost. Uh, the other astounding thing is the amount of phosphorus that we apply with that. You know, assuming this, this crop with 50 pounds of removal, we're looking at, you know, anywhere from, from 10 to 15 years of worth of crop removal P there. Uh, you know, we, we worry about applying poultry litter at those rates, but I mean, look at compost. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to point out here is, you know, we can buy these blended materials uh, that, that actually do have pretty good uh, nutrient ratios, and, and we can do, you know, balanced fertilization. 
the, the challenge is that this is expensive. Um, I worked the numbers out. It's, it's been five or six years. Uh, and, and actually for this product, which is actually locally available here, I got this from uh, Seaford, Delaware, uh, just down the road from the Purdue AgriCycle plant. And when I worked out the dollars per pound of plant available and measured in the lab, you know, I, I measured it with real numbers, I came up with uh, somewhere around five to seven dollars per pound of plant available in. Um, when you work out those kind of numbers for, for poultry litter, depending on you know, uh, who you're getting it from and how far you got to haul it, you know, you can, you can get nitrogen from that, plant available nitrogen, anywhere from you know, 50 to 70 cents a pound. So you know, we might be able to do this for uh, you know, organic market uh, tomatoes or something. We're certainly not going to grow organic field corn with uh, you know, 5 to $7 nitrogen. Um, the other one that, I, that you know, what, when I kind of put this out to the, uh, the growers I was working with in New England and you know, illustrated the, the problems with uh, over applying P, none of them really believed me. So I started pulling out uh, <coughs> some data from a, a study I did during my master's work at Virginia Tech where we looked at repeated compost application effects on phosphorus runoff, and this is in the work done in the Virginia Piedmont, our field plots here in the background. Uh, as a crow flies somewhere around 10 to 15 miles uh, from Jefferson's Monticello. So these deep red, uh, really heavy clay soils, a lot of iron and aluminum oxide. These soils can, can absorb a lot of phosphorus. Um, we wanted to see what happens if we keep loading them up with, with this compost pea, what happens to the, the runoff water quality. So I'm not going to show you all the, the treatments, just a select few to illustrate the, the principles, but you know, with an unamended control, a commercial fertilizer, we applied uh, fertilizer based on Virginia Tech soil test recommendations, and then we had two composts in this study, one poultry litter yard waste compost and one uh, biosolids compost. Of course, the biosolids compost wouldn't be allowed in, uh, in organic cropping systems, but I think uh, you know, it illustrates the principle here. Uh, and then each year for four years, we applied 30 to 40 tons per acre per year at a rate high enough to meet nitrogen needs of, of uh, the first three years is market vegetables, uh, sweet pepper, sweet corn, uh, pumpkin, and then the last year we grew field corn. And then in that, at the end of the fourth season, we conducted a simulated rainfall. So over these plots, you know, <clears throat> collected rainfall and these, these weirs and measured the uh, concentration of phosphorus in that runoff. But first, we can look at the effects of uh, those treatments on soil test phosphorus again in the fourth year. In the fall of that fourth year, we went from an initial soil test level of, of uh, 20 parts per million malic 3 all the way up to 120 parts per million in that highest compost. Uh, to move malic 3 100 parts per million in any soil is pretty astonishing, but to move malic 3 100 parts per million in four years in a Piedmont soil with those levels of iron aluminum oxides is, is pretty awesome but we were applying you know, uh, 30 to 40 tons per acre per year. Uh, so it, it certainly got us there. And uh, when we think, look at what that meant in terms of uh, runoff water quality, this is dissolved phosphorus in the runoff. This is uh, one of the fractions of, of phosphorus in runoff that's associated with algal blooms and uh, freshwater bodies. And you see that, you know, that this compost treatments stick out uh, and, and we significantly increase the concentration of phosphorus in runoff. And, you know, I don't know why this, a lot of the, 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 the growers I was working with in New England found this so surprising, but it, it really bothered them. They, they had a really hard time believing that, you know, a, a compost uh, that they're applying to their organic market gardens could, could have those kinds of impacts on water quality. That, that they had any negative impact on the environment was, was beyond them. So one of the things I, I, I pushed really hard with these guys, you know, most of the, the organic uh, growers I worked with, especially up there, were actually really good about soil testing. Soil testing it, it, almost every year and, and on a really high resolution, you know, they're, they're soil testing every bed. Um, but what they're looking for, what they like to see is, you know, you guys have seen these reports and it doesn't matter whether they're from Penn State or uh, wherever, you know, we've got this, in, this, these bar graphs to interpret the, the values. They like to see it when they're all up over here up against the stops. And, you know, too often what we find is, you know, especially when we start looking at, at, at these phosphorus levels, you know, they're not only up against the stops, you know, they're, they're running off two or three pages. Uh, and it, it took a little, a little bit of time for me to convince them that, 
you know, not only do we not want to get them up against the stops, we really want to keep them down here and, and you know, top end of the optimum is okay. You know, you don't need any more than that. Um, so started, you know, trying to convince them to use those sold tests, not only to, to look for nitrogen need, but also track buildup. And then think about, you know, when, when we start getting up in there, start adjusting their rates and looking for different sources of nitrogen that aren't going to overload that system with phosphorus. So, you know, the question is, is you know, in these systems, you know, where do we move from there? Once we've loaded up that soil with, with phosphorus, you know, what, what other alternative sources of nitrogen are there? And this is where I come into, uh, you know, my push for, for moving more legumes in these systems. So, uh, again, this is why I see it as, as really the most sustainable source of nitrogen in these systems because we're not overloading the soil with phosphorus or in situations where we do have a soil that's, that's uh, overloaded, you know, we can get away from those amendments to, to stop building up anymore. Um, and if they're managed properly, uh, these can satisfy, if not all, at least a significant portion of crop nitrogen needs. Um, but again, that, it's that managed properly. We've got to manage them with a, a pretty high level. Yes, sir? Yeah, good question. Uh, so his question was, you know, if, if, we're, if we're looking at getting enough nitrogen from legumes, do we need to lay out for a year, go fallow and, and basically grow a green manure in, in, for a year? Um, I, I know of a few growers that are doing that. Uh, they're, they're land rich, um, and there, there aren't many of those, especially in New England uh, and, and not uh, in this part of the world either. Um, uh, most of the, the systems that, that I've worked in where, where we're using these materials, we're either growing a, a perennial forage um, and we're harvesting that forage for, for feed, or we're growing an annual legume, and we're just we're trying to squeeze it into the into the rotation any way we can. Now, I won't say that, you know, in order to really optimize the, the performance of these things, you really got to make some manipulations to the, the crop rotation in order to squeeze them in, because we're we're trying to get enough biomass in these things that, you know, we can meet, you know, if not all, a significant portion of the crop's end needs. So, you know, that really is is. Uh, the simple aspect of it, you know, how much nitrogen can we get out of them? It depends on how much biomass we can grow and what its nitrogen content is, which is really going to be a, a function of both the species and even variety. Uh, and then finally, you know, how well a stand we can get established. Uh, and then this is, you know, sort of the tricky one. Uh, and it depends on what we're growing, you know, how long we can leave it out there in the field. We've got to get it planted on time, especially if we're talking about an annual legume, but how late into the spring can we let it grow? So just to kind of illustrate the, the range of, of values we can get from a selected set of uh, legumes for, that are adapted to mid-Atlantic, you know, two of the, three of the annuals, uh, hairy vetch, crimson clover, and uh, Austrian winter pea. Uh, you know, the biannual red clovers and alfalfa would be more in the, in the forage type system. Um, so I, I came up with these values just looking at the biomass content and the nitrogen content, which will range anywhere from about 3 to 3.5%, 3 .5 and assume that about 50% of that uh, will become plant available over the growing season. That's a, a pretty conservative rule of thumb. Uh, you'll, you'll see levels higher than that, but I think it's, uh, it's generally safe to go with that and, and you know, kind of come up with these numbers for nutrient management planning. Uh, you, know, you don't want to be over-optimistic. Uh, better to have, better to, to fall a little bit short or be a little bit, uh, be a little bit conservative uh, and, and not run the risk of running out. So in terms of stand establishment, you know, it, it's one thing to, to say, you know, you got to get good seed and, and get it out there and get it drilled on time. Uh, you know, even when you do everything right, uh, Mother Nature sometimes doesn't cooperate. To illustrate that, this is uh, two pictures back to, uh, one year after the other, same farm adjacent fields. Uh, we planted it within the same week. Uh, this is the same seed source of, of hairy vetch. And, you know, what happened this year is uh, we had a, a, a late February uh, really, really hard freeze with no snow cover and just wiped it out. Uh, I mean, we only had just a, a few crowns that survived and, and regrew. This, both these pictures are taken in uh, early to mid-May. Here we only got about 500 pounds of biomass, and we measured the amount of available nitrogen we got out. It was less than 20 pounds per acre. Well, the very next year, uh, you know, vetch did really well for us. 6,000 pounds of biomass, uh, and, and we measured about 120 pounds of plant available nitrogen out of that. 
So the other one is, is you know, we get it planted in time, get a good stand. What about going into the spring? Uh, <clears throat> this is a summary of uh, Andy Clark's work, also in Beltsville, Maryland, back from the, the mid-90s. And they looked at dry matter accumulation and, and bio, or, uh, biomass nitrogen content from mid-April all the way through mid-May. And again, the average over three years. And I calculated the uh, dry matter accumulation rate over that one month period, about 54 pounds per acre per day, um, with nitrogen being about one and a half pounds per acre per day. So, you know, we're definitely building up a, a lot of uh, potential plant available nitrogen during this period. Of course, the, the thing that we're looking at is that, you know, a lot of us are itching to start planting corn uh, here or even earlier. And what we're looking at here is we got to let this stuff grow for another month. Mid-May, uh, that vet starts to flower. That's the maximum amount of biomass we can make. So, you know, we're, if we're going to delay this to get the the max amount of nitrogen, we're starting to really squeeze our growing season there and, and you know, uh, potentially uh, limit, uh, limit the ability of that corn to really perform. So, you know, you've you got to balance those. Uh, another question that we looked at uh, while I was in ARS is, you know, how quickly is this uh, legume cover crop decompose? after we plow it in, how quickly does that nitrogen become available? You know, season long, mid-season, you know, all right away. Uh, there was a, a graduate student, Hannah Poffenberger, looking at this while I was there. And just real quick, summarize some of her data. Basically what she did is, is went out these uh, cover crop plots and, and cut, uh, in this case, hairy vetch out of a, a measured quadrant out in the field, but that material back into the lab and tucked it into uh, these mesh bags. So folding a, a known amount of, of biomass into a mesh bag, and she did a whole series of these so she could take them out to the field and fold them into the, into the soil and then periodically once a week go out there and pull them out and measure the amount of biomass that's left and what its nitrogen content is. So we can get an idea of how that decomposed through the season. And we can look at just a, a quick summary of that. This is a percentage of mass remaining over time and the percentage of nitrogen remaining, meaning that, you know, if, if it's not left in the legume, we assume that it's been mineralized and released in the soil solution in plant available forms. And again, with this exponential type relationship, we can calculate this half-life. And she came up with a half-life of less than one week. So in less than one week, half that nitrogen that's in that material has been released. And, you know, again, this is one of those we've always kind of thought about as being a, a slow release source of material. And, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, less than one week, you know, if, if, if we're uh, plowing this down, I mean, how soon from under, like, perfect conditions, how soon after we disc this down until uh, we can feel confident in, in establishing a, a nice stand of corn? I'd say seven days, ten weeks, ten day, seven, ten days, like, it's pushing it, perfect conditions. So, you know, during that time, we've released half the nitrogen that material is going to release. So, again, thinking about how that... Uh, what that means in terms of synchronizing nitrogen availability with crop in demand. We'll come around to that subject in, again in a minute. So the other question is, you know, I, I told you that rule of thumb, you know, we're only going to see about 50% of the, the nitrogen from, from legumes and, you know, some fraction of the, the nitrogen from all of these organic materials ranging from 10 to, you know, 90%. What happens to the rest of that nitrogen? Where does that end up? Well, it ends up in the soil organic matter. Um, and to, to illustrate this, uh, I tend to think about soil organic matter as, as not just in terms of uh, its total quantity, but also its quality. And we can think about it as consisting of, of three different components, one being the, the living biomass, which would be the roots, the microbes, earthworms. Uh, the second would be the, the fragmented remains of those materials. We call that the, the active fraction. And finally, the, the residues of decay, which we can call the you know, soil humus. When we think about nutrient turnover and, and release, it's this active fraction that really plays the biggest role. And we know that in organic cropping systems, we're using a lot of uh, cover crops and, and managing a lot of, uh, managing fertility with a lot of organic inputs, the compost and animal manures. Uh, those are enriching that active pool. And then practices like tillage and, and cultivation for weed control, those are uh, depleting that active pool. That we're, we're uh, hastening their decomposition, which releases all of those nutrients. 
So this turns out to be a, a really important source of, of nutrients in these systems. Um, in fact, you know, from, from the work we've done on farm and, and, uh, and the, the long-term farming system experiments where we include these, these types of treatments, we found that, you know, depending on the, the soil of the system and the year and all of these, this can often be uh, enough nitrogen to satisfy, if not a, a, you know, the vast majority, almost all of the, the nitrogen needs for, for field corn and, and, you know, not 100 bushel corn, you know, 180 bushel corn. So, you know, this is sort of the, the age old question, can we use some measure of that to predict nitrogen uh, availability? Um, I guess, let me break this up into two questions. One is, can we measure the act of fraction? Um, and I'd say, yeah, uh, you know, we've, we've come up with a bunch of different ways to measure. We can measure it chemically, biologically, physically. We can fractionate soil organic matters you know, a hundred different ways, and we've been doing that going back uh, 70, 80 years. Um, the question is, is, do any of those correlate with uh, nitrogen availability? And, and, and again, it comes down to the fact that that nitrogen cycle is just tough. Um, and in humid environments, it's significantly influenced by the weather. Um, and no matter what measurement we're making, if it's, if it's done pre-season, uh, it, it's not gonna do well at predicting nitrogen availability um, unless we can predict the weather. So. We're still stuck in that same predicament we are in, in all of our cropping systems when, when it comes to nitrogen testing. Still, you know, I, I think uh, using some sort of in-season observation, be it a, a pre-side dress soil nitrate test or, you know, a, a, a check plots where we're actually going and omitting an area, uh, you know, where, where we're either not applying an organic amendment and, you know, a strip or, or a patch where we've laid down a tarp, uh, or not planting a legume, or even just harvesting all the top growth from one area, uh, so that we can look at how much nitrogen we're actually getting from the soil. I think it's a, a, a great way to, you know, get a handle on, uh, you know, how much how much nitrogen we're it, we're, it, uh, we're being provided by the decomposition of that active fraction, and how much we may need to uh, supplement, you know, with with external inputs. All right, and finally, the last thing I want to touch on is, is <clears throat> this concept of synchronizing nitrogen supply within demand. And this is something we've been looking at for a really long time in, in conventional systems. And we know that, you know, at least in annual crops, that in uptake curve closely matches uh, dry matter production. And we know that whenever we can uh, improve the pattern of nitrogen release to nitrogen uptake, we can significantly increase uh, nitrogen use efficiency. The question is, you know, how do we apply this in, in organic cropping systems? Can we do it with side dressing? And I, I absolutely think it's, a, it's something we should explore. Um, we need to be working with materials with, with pretty rapid end release. So like those four materials we looked at first, a pelletized poultry litter or something might have a little bit of feather meal in it, something that's going to mineralize really quick. Um, might need to be innovative and in, in coming up with a, a way to apply it. In this case, uh, this is a... Uh, a unit we, we modified a couple of Clampco uh, drop spreaders, tied them into some drop tubes, and here we actually tied these into uh, a couple of Dawn injectors. Uh, I don't think we need to inject it everywhere since, you know, the other thing that we could tie this in with is, is uh, cultivation. You know, apply these materials right, right before your, your, uh, your last cultivation or, or the second to last cultivation, get them incorporated right about that, that time we need it. And then, of course, you know, we're working with uh, food crops, especially uh, raw vegetables. We've got to stay away from, from raw manures. But, you know, if we're working with uh, the pelletized materials, most of those have been pasteurized and, and are food safe. Um, so one of the, the projects I worked on, we actually looked at with those same four materials we were looking at from that incubation study, uh, poultry litter, pelletized poultry litter, this uh, poultry litter feather meal blend and feather meal. We looked at the effects of uh, applying it at the same rate. All these materials applied at the same uh, estimated rate of plant available nitrogen, either pre-plant in the dark green or side dressed in the light green. Uh, and what we saw is that in every single case with each one of those materials, we saw a significant yield increase with the side dressing. Uh, and when we actually backed out the numbers, uh, it worked out to be a, almost a 20% improvement in nitrogen use efficiency. So, we, uh, we ran this through as some preliminary data and got a grant to take it out and do it on uh, three farms in the region. 
2011 and 2012, uh, and basically set up the, a, a really similar experiment, uh, this time only using pelletized poultry litter. And, you know, as often is the case, we make things work, uh, you know, in the lab, in this case, uh, on station in the field in Beltsville. We took it out the field and didn't see anything, even close to what we saw in the field. Uh, so we did not see any significant differences here uh, with pre-plant versus side dress. And, and, you know, one of the things in, in talking with uh, the growers that we cooperated on this with and, and my counterparts that were involved in this is, you know, is, is side dressing still worth it? And from my point of view, I, I think it's absolutely something worth considering because one of the things that, that side dressing does do for us is by postponing that nitrogen application, it gives you that much more information about what the growing season is going to be like. Did we have a lot of leaching early in the season? You know, was it was it drier and, and you know warmer that you know so we might have conserved some of that that nitrogen mineralized from you know our legume or soil organic matter, um, and then use some sort of in-season observation whether it's the the PSNT or comparison to some omission plot or just you know field observations to inform how much uh, material we're going to apply because we know it's different every year, um, and you know the fact that we didn't see a, a you know a yield boost due to pre-plant versus side dress or a yield difference. The fact that we didn't see a significant difference at all uh, suggests to me that you know it, it, it's worth exploring. So just to kind of summarize, you know, I, I think that you know the way I think about it when we when we uh, manage these systems, we really need to take more of a, an integrated approach, uh, working toward you know at least start now developing this this soil fertility foundation by building up this passive pools of soil organic by, by applying compost and using lots of uh, cover crops and, and look at this as being our, our long-term nutrient reserves and then managing fertility going forward by maintaining those active pools by using you know annual legumes in the rotation uh, using uh, amendments with rapid nutrient release trying to keep those things optimized and then you know it's 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 not one of those things of you know if we get high soil test levels, uh, phosphorus levels, it's, it's when we do. It, it, I haven't seen an organic cropping system yet that wasn't either heading toward that or, or already had excessive levels of phosphorus. We really need to start looking at, at backing off on our, backing off or eliminating animal manures and compost from the system uh, and, and moving to a, a system that, you know, where we've refined our, our crop rotations to include either annual legumes or, you know, a, a, a forage legume in the rotation. And finally, recognizing the potential for a, a substantial portion of, of uh, the crop's nitrogen needs coming from, from the decomposition of soil organic matter um, and, and using, you know, either the omission plots or the pre-side pre dress soil nitrate to, to monitor that over time. So over time we can start to uh, uh, adapt and, and make changes to our external inputs. And finally, you know, look at ways to improve the synchrony between nitrogen supply and uh, by amendments and soil organic matter and, and crop end need. And I think, you know, there, there are all sorts of ways, you know, even the act of cultivating weeds, by going through with that cultivator um, and stirring things up, you're stimulating the decomposition, especially of that active fraction. You can think about it as being sort of a, like a small side dress uh, application of end. We, we actually looked at that, uh, worked with a, a weed ecologist, and we were looking at, at nitrogen release following cultivation uh, and, and these weed plots he was looking at. And, and it actually was pretty surprising, the amount of nitrogen you get released right after a cultivation. Um, you can often see, you know, this, this flash of green, and, you know, a, a couple of days after a, a cultivation, especially if you get a, a nice rain. And just uh, a few helpful resources, resources that I found helpful uh, in, in thinking about these systems I'd share with you. I think we've left uh, 